I'll fix it with duct tape. Done. What happens if you don't take care of your equipment? Well, what you will see is that uh, not a rapid change, but it will start falling apart bit by bit, slowly, slowly, piece by piece. And uh, sooner or later, uh, you or your product owner or your client uh, will start to notice. But in the short term, absolutely nothing will be seen. Greger talked about three types of technical debt when I visited his home. What is your definition of technical debt? You can take another angle, I think. Uh, I like Gregor's definition, but, but expanding on it, uh, I think you have at least two varieties. Uh, one would be the, the technical depth that you are aware of, things that people in your organization have either understood and even perhaps tried to solve. Uh, one way or another, they can do that. And there is more the, the unconscious uh, technical depth, things that nobody really understands that it is a technical depth. They might see the symptoms that they are not able to change, not able to, to do whatever they like to, uh, but they not really aware of it. Uh, so th that could be some kind of definition. You could also talk about layers. Um, the very basic layer when you talk about technical depth it goes around uh, life cycle management of, of things you are dependent on. Things like third party uh, frameworks, uh, open source frameworks, tools and so on. Uh, underlying infrastructure, the uh, versioning and, the, and the, the different tools and different uh, firmwares and so on. And uh, that would be the first uh, thing that you see in technical depth is that you don't really handle that situation. You don't upgrade your, your dependencies, you don't upgrade your, your infrastructure and so on. So that, that would be kind of the first layer. Second there is more things that you actually are in control of yourself. Uh, when you don't uh, adopt your, your system, when you don't in adopt the internal structure of the system, um, and depending on how you see it, uh, you could be faced with problems in one or the other, or both, of course. Uh, but normally, uh, at least the first level is, is kind of easy to handle. Uh, but for sure, that's a kind of technical depth that, that is m most obvious in, in most organizations, that you simply don't handle the basics. Technical debt. It's become a very popular word or phrase over the last uh, few years. But I would say that technical debt are all the things that prevent us, uh, all the things that we have done maybe not so well in the past that prevent us from doing what we want today. There's a lot of definitions about technical debt, but when will the owner see that it's something wrong? Well, eventually, as I said, you, uh, these kind of problems will accumulate and they will surface. And th that typically um, comes in a couple of flavors. One would be that there is uh, some external pressure, there is new legislation, or there is a comp competitor coming up in your space attacking you or your products and services. Uh, and you need to change. And that change, uh, which might be seen from a product owner point of view or a business point of view, to be a quite simple thing actually becomes quite expensive and quite cumbersome to, to handle. So, so that, is, that is one thing that you, you, you need to do a change and, and you suddenly you can't or it becomes very hard. The second kind uh, or another way of seeing it is that things are becoming slow and or expensive. We talk about three kinds at least of technical debt. We have the one that comes from poor execution. We have the one that comes from the context changing. And the third thing is the architecture of that. Uh, I've worked with clients uh, where the, the accumulation of technical depth, and now we're talking about a couple of decades of accumulation, come up to the point where the operation of, of my client actually amounted for double cost. They, they compared to competition, they had an operational cost that actually was literally twice as much as competition. And in a regulated market, as th this, this was a banking industry, uh, when you are in this regulated market, that might be okay. You're more expensive on the market than in other countries. But what happens if there is a deregulation? And this ex exact thing happened to my client. Um, EU announced a deregulation uh, that uh, w would actually be a way of allowing competition into Sweden in this case. And my client knew that their competitors would be able to operate on half the price. And that was a very obvious thing about technical depth coming to the surface. Kreger, here is your fence. What is the problem? 
Casimir, when I built this fence, um, I asked uh, people, I, I checked online and I, I went to the store and, and they gave me a brochure on how to build it. And everyone said, build with these diagonal supports. That's the best way to create a stable corner. But as you can see, the um, corner pole is bending inwards. And what happens when you build the diagonal supports is that you don't really create supports, you create fulcrums. But, but you follow the best practices. Uh, yes, um, I, I, I thought I did the right construction, but it was the wrong construction. And I've had now to do architecture refactoring and rebuilding the cor some of the corners, the ones that had most of this rotation, uh, to another solution that I'll show you now. You only need two things in life, duct tape and BD40. What happens if you use the same approach in software maintenance? <laughs> yeah, th that is kind of the silver bullet thing. Uh, and of course there is no silver bullet. Um, there is no, when talking about uh, technical depth, there is not one size fits all right silver bullet that solves everything. Uh, you need different approaches, you need different kind of, of uh, ways of dealing with that problem. Uh, so so uh, it doesn't really apply. But same with your, your analogy, I mean, uh, when using VD40 and when using duct tape, yeah, you can fix problems, but it becomes a temporary solution. It becomes something where you most likely are aiming for solving the symptoms, removing the symptoms, rather than, than uh, solving the actual underlying problem. And that is what we see many times with uh, technical depth, is that people are attacking the symptoms. They perhaps are able to do something in order to, to, to overcome the, the urgent problem, but they're actually not solving the underlying problem. And so, it, so far that analogy goes, goes fine. Casimir, here you can see what can really happen in the worst case. This pole has completely exited the ground and I have to redo this corner. I had built it with the old construction with the diagonal support. Uh, and so I recently refactored it. What I did was that I added this uh, brace here and then I added an additional wire. And what it does, so what happens with the diagonal brace is that the force uh, from the wire pushes down into the ground and then pulls the pole out of the ground. With this construction, the force from the wires is pushed to this pole, but then it's uh, pulled by this wired down back into the ground of the pole, uh, meaning that the pole is more secure instead of less secure. The more pressure there is on it, the more secure it is. And you can apply the same on IT system that was built with best practices 15, 20 years ago. Absolutely. I mean, many of the things that were best practices then, let's say for instance, uh, uh, client-server uh, solutions are now superseded with other solutions like uh, APIs and so on. Uh, so um, uh, many of those uh, can be rebuilt, refactored and uh, be much more future-friendly. Technical depth can look very different. What is the most extreme you have seen? Uh, the most extreme case I've uh, seen so far is, is uh, a client I'm working with right now. Uh, there is a new set of EU legislation that is fundamentally changing the, some of the criteria uh, that, that you need to comply with. And EU is quite tough in this situation. Uh, all companies in Europe that are operating under the existing licenses actually need to re-seek the license to operate. Uh, if you can't demonstrate that you're following these uh, regulations by a certain date not too far into the future, you will not be allowed to continue operating and that means bankruptcy. So yes, a simple thing like technical debts can actually be a question about the, whether the company can continue to exist or not. I'm, I'm sitting here in an ornamental pond and there should be water up to my chest, but there isn't. There is no water at all here. And I think this illustrates two types of technical debt. Uh, first of all, the material that was used uh, to line the pond is uh, high density polyethene, HDPE, which is kind of very hard to uh, amend. Uh, normally you use uh, a rubber coating and then you can just fix it with, with normal, um, just like you fix a, a tire on a bike. 
what about best practices that were good when you built it and aren't anymore? This is a very old building. You can maintain a system for a very long time. Uh, you could look into the uh, nuclear industry where they are able to actually sustain systems for 40 to 50 years. Uh, of course not without implications. Uh, the, the, the change rate needs to be very low uh, but, but obviously in a nuclear plant when you operate the, the, the actual nuclear processes requirements don't change too often. But then the other problem is that with all this heavy stone on top of the um, um, material, I can't easily replace it because there are tons and tons of stone uh, on top of it. So uh, the construction makes maintenance hard. But beyond that, uh, the, the first best practice uh, would be not to wait. Uh, do your homework, do your basics like life cycle management. Uh, things that are out of your control, like a third party uh, platform or a third party uh, product, you need to follow. Uh, you will not be able to just throw money on it or use your own people to solve it. If it's beyond your control, make sure you follow the, the life cycles. Uh, that would be the very first one. Uh, second would be to monitor changes. Uh, of course, if you're talking about disrupting changes, it's quite hard to predict or to, to uh, monitor. But most things in most companies are not disruptive. And the result is that if you want to do maintenance, it will be a much higher cost than it, it had another construction, I guess. Basically, if I want to do maintenance, I have to tear the whole thing down and rebuild it from start. And then you will not use the same construction anymore. No, then I will use the rubber because with the rubber it's easy to fix without doing that. Then I can fix small problems and even bigger problems with um, just how you normally fix rubber. So this is the same with some code I guess? Yes, uh, of course. It's, it's the very same thing. That, that the, the, the code is, is, let's call it fragile, meaning that that you can't fix a problem in a single location. Everything is everywhere. They call it spaghetti programming. You know, just because you don't have GOAT in your code doesn't mean you don't have spaghetti code. If your change rate is going down, if you have clients or businesses saying that simple things are becoming cumbersome, uh, they think that something that from a business point of view would be quite simple to implement suddenly becomes hard, that's a signal that you're going in the wrong way. So monitor your internal KPIs and that is things like cost of course, change rate uh, and the, the velocity of change. So trying to figure out and foresee or find the signals of that whether you're going in the wrong direction or the right direction. Uh, it's not too hard. Uh, the problem is that most organizations I work with, they have no clue. They don't monitor it. From your experience, is this something you measure in companies today? Some companies do and some companies don't. It, I think it's really depending on the company culture. But for some companies, having a small technical debt, well, um, one way to measure it, as I said, is, is the proportion of maintenance cost to investment cost. And I think everyone has that. Another way to measure it is time to fix. If you have high technical debt, it takes a long time to fix bugs. And I think most companies don't really measure that. But something that is even more important about technical debt is that it li limits your ability to innovate. First of all, because of all your money being tied up in maintenance, but then because of your technical debt, all your systems are fragile and you have to spend so much more money uh, and it takes so much more time if you want to do something new. So another way to measure uh, technical debt is, on, is how fast can you turn the ship around? How fast can you introduce a new feature? Let's say you're a bank and suddenly you decide to support blockchain. Well, how, how long does it take before from the decision until you actually support it? When should you stop maintaining a system due to technology advances? 
I'm not too sure that actually would be a reason to stop maintaining it, as long as the system actually is providing a business value uh, or a business capability that is hard to replace or hard to, to buy. Uh, technology advances by themselves uh, actually don't really drive uh, technology. That is an opportunity that you might uh, consider. Uh, the problem comes, of course, when your competition is uh, adopting that kind of new technology and you don't, and that becomes a gap in the market. Uh, but simply because there is a new technology doesn't mean you have to jump on it. Uh, I mean, we, we would spend so much time if we just tried to adopt to whatever is happening. So uh, is there awareness in the business side of the company of the technical debt that you often have in IT? I think there is a growing awareness of that the IT landscape uh, can really hamper business innovation. Uh, and people are starting to measure it and I, people are being more and more acceptable on spending money that doesn't really give any benefit except reducing technical debt. And I think also from IT departments we're becoming much better at quantifying the benefits of reducing technical debt. Running a mainframe with old COBOL system, that is not a technical debt? It could be a technical debt. Uh, if you consider it from cost point of view, change velocity point of view and risk point of view and so on, uh, you can come up to the solution or a situation where you, you regard a cable system on a mainframe as a, a, a problem or not. Uh, I, I mean, I worked myself with mainframe systems that have had very modern architecture, three-tiered la layering and so on. Uh, most mainframe systems are not done like that. Uh, so the te technology itself uh, doesn't imply whether you have a problem or not. Uh, but for sure, um, most cable systems are coming to an end, for sure. Uh, not because of a cable, not because of mainframes, but because of perhaps 30 or 40 of years of uh, accumulated technical depth from the design, not from the technology. It's really nice to have you back here, and you are came for this season, season oh, four. Absolutely, nice to be here. Thank you. So, thank you very much for talking about technical depths and also about showing your experience in real life. Well, I think it makes it more concrete um, to see that you know technical debt isn't just some IT term. It's something that applies everywhere. Let, let's call it you know latent risk or. Um, there are other words that we could use, but I think right now technical debt is the popular term.